All righty, good morning, everybody. So, another fine day, another fine morning. Do a little Q&A here and some log review, I guess, to fill in the gaps as we wait for people to, to fill in with, uh, any questions. So go ahead and light up the questions, um, and I will try to address them promptly. Uh, just a reminder, as always, Super Chats as well, if I'm not getting to you or, or whatnot, I'm trying to see all the questions over on the right, but uh, that's available at your discretion. And uh, like I said, go ahead and fire up any questions you have. Grab a cup of coffee and we'll get into it. So uh, as people are rolling in here, I good morning. Good morning, Eric uh, Milton. Good morning as well. As people are rolling in here, I uh, have some recent stuff I got from some folks on their flights and whatnot uh, for some log review, so I can take a look at that a while. And uh, yeah, we'll, go, we'll kind of go from there. Uh, hopefully this time is a little, I tried to go a little later here on the time frame, just for folks so that uh, yeah, we can spread the gap there. It's tough for the European all the way to West Coast California. It's quite a spread, uh, six, seven, eight, nine hour difference between them all. So yeah, New Zealand. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably, you're in New Zealand, you're, it's probably late at night. There's a lot of people I deal with, uh, like Chris Thompson and whatnot, and a lot of people from Australia. So it's always interesting that it's, it's if I remember correctly, it's always the same time, it's just 24 hours different, or not 24 hours, 12 hours different. So it's the same time, just opposite AM, PM, if I remember correctly. But um, yeah, it's always interesting. It's a fun part of the hobby, the time zone differences. It's something you don't deal with, at least I don't deal with on a normal basis for my day job. But uh, so anyways, I have a log here. Uh, like I said, go ahead and put in any questions you have. Um, what do you think about, so uh, Watto's FPV asks, well, what do you think about Brian White's new gradient feature in PID toolbox? Looks like it'll be quite a leap forward in PID tuning. Uh, I have not seen that yet. Maybe we'll have to check that out. Is that on, did he release that on the PID toolbox? Uh, GitHub page. Maybe we'll take a we'll take a, a quick uh, look at that here. Let me go to here. So GitHub. Um, if folks aren't aware. Pit Toolbox is an awesome tool by Brian White. It kind of started by him and I chatting about here. I have it right here. Five days ago. Yeah, he has one. You know, let's go take a look at it. Kind of talked about uh, started with Brian White and I chatting about. Um, objective versus subjective PID tunes and filter settings and all that. And I propose the argument that a PID tune is not an, it can be objective uh, or it can be subjective. So it's, you know, how you feel about it. Like art. Art's not a, it's, how you, it's like music, you know, how you feel about it. It's different for everybody. Like a movie, it's different for everybody. But that really when it comes to a pit tune and filter settings and all that kind of stuff, it can be, we can try to objectify things. And that's kind of the scientific approach, right? You're trying to make an objective uh, thing out of something subjective, like you, you feel that it's warm out today. That's a subjective thing. How do you make it objective as you developed a thermostat or a temperature gradient range so you can put numbers to it and get a little bit more uh, close um, definition of what temperature is. So anyways, with quad tuning, I proposed uh, a number of years ago that really pit error is the, the objective measure on a tune or anything. That the whatever tune settings, filters, whatever code, whatever produces the least amount of pit error is the best. And pit error is the difference between what you're commanding it to do with your sticks versus what the quad is actually doing. So that is, uh, I developed a Excel spreadsheet, which was pretty heavy weight to, to look at pit error. And uh, then Brian, he works with MATLAB and he has, I don't, his job sounds cooler than my job, 
but uh, he took it to like the whole next level and developed PID Toolbox here. So let me uh, look in here. There's branches, tax tools. Now I'm getting lost. Where did they redid this a little bit? Where is releases, pull request, actions, projects? Let me back up. I actually was on the releases. So this should be five days ago. So this is the release. Yeah, let's download this and we'll take a take a gander at it. Windows, blah blah blah. Do a save on that and pull that up. So, anyways, um, yeah, we'll take a look. I have not looked at the gradient feature. So he has posted a little screenshot the other day. I don't believe it. Oh, you don't believe it's been added to GitHub yet. So basically talking the log and showing oh, what the log might look like in different pin values. Wow, that's a big deal. So you can post or you can change the PID values and it's going to adjust what it might look like. Interesting. I'll, that'll be interesting to see how he's doing that. Obviously it's not gonna be completely accurate because there's a lot more dynamics than that. But um, yeah. So uh, yeah, we'll take a look at that. That's pretty cool. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, Ask him to get a little beta release of that. Uh, next question from Brian Uetico. Uh, I have a seven-inch uh, Glide Hummer with 2206.5, 1300 kV motors. So it has plenty of motor. Yeah, 2806 is pretty good. When I fly straight forward, it flies smooth until I induce any pitch or roll. Then it starts. Uh, yeah overshooting and floppy so if it's is it an oscillation brian where it's you're inducing a, a roll or a pitch and it's oscillating as you're like a steady move or is it a sharp move that it has some bounce back or oscillation so it it matters between the two things um and prop wash so let me know on that and then we can answer that question a little bit better. So, and that's kind of leads into one thing here, guys, with um, just tuning in general. You know, a lot of times, and I've been thinking about this a lot and kind of like a flow chart for problem solving, but one symptom can be so many things. It's hard to really do a flow chart. It would be an awful you need a big sheet of paper and a lot of arrows going all over the place and multiple arrows will lead from multiple things. So it's been something I've been thinking about. Um, but, uh, and I think Helio, I know Helio tried to do one, but it's not, that's not the end all be all. There's other things involved that could cause some of the issues that and then they're pointing to an arrow, like, go do this. That's the simple fix. And it's like, no, 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 that, that may be one of the fixes, but there could be multiple fixes you need to look at. Uh, what is my profession? I'm an engineer and I'm a civil engineer. We deal with control for like wastewater treatment and pl flow processing stations for like uh, water uh, distribution systems, wastewater treatment systems, pump stations, things of that nature. So this whole PID concept, uh, not so much the filters, but the PID concepts, uh, you know, we use those all the time for all kind of mechanisms and whatnot. Um, and that's where I think one of the things with quadcopters is just so everybody realizes, like, like PIDs and filters and all this stuff is ancient technology. Like this stuff has been in existence since like the early 1900s. Um, I don't know exactly when I'd have to research it, but they're just applying it to a quadcopter. Same thing with like filtering, like that that low pass filter we use, like the PT1 and biquad. Like that's the exact same low pass filter equation that is used in your car radio for turning down the treble. And so, you know, we'll say like, oh, you know, uh, lowering the cutoff of a low pass filter is like going in your car and turning down the treble. And it's like, oh, that's an analogy. It's like, no, 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 it's the exact, exact same equation that's used for both. Cause you're, you know, what is sound? It's vibration. So what is the gyro picking up from the frame, from the motors is also vibration. And these equations reduce, you know, takes that digitalized signal. Your radio has a digital signal and it reduces the amplitude of that wave. Same thing. Hey, what's going on, Ciotti? Looks like I saw you have a, uh, a uh, one o'clock. I think you have a one o'clock live stream sliding into the Bardwell spot. And I 
I was thinking about the same thing. I'm like, well, he's not doing one today. I'll throw a, a live stream, but uh, uh, we're going to the pool today. So <laughs> one o'clock's a little late for me. It's like, I'll do it in the morning and then we'll go. So uh, anyways, uh, what's your take on FR Sky's antenna length? It's been getting around 100 meters on uh, really noisy environments. 24 millimeter antenna long. I'm currently uh, testing PALS 27 millimeter antenna length. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Um, I've become too frustrated with FR Sky to deal with them anymore. Uh, so I don't really pay attention. I have been, when Crossfire came out, it was a little too rich for my blood. So I went and got the R9 system and I was a big proponent of the R9 system. I was like, wow, you know, bang for the buck, all pol politics and drama aside, uh, works pretty well. And the frame weight was pretty low, but I started noticing that there's like a heartbeat in frame rate jumping with the R9 system. And I put it on FR Sky's radar in a professional way, reaching out to their engineers directly and their sales reps over a year ago. Yeah, it was like April, March, April, 2019. They've, they fixed it in access. And what burns me with FR Sky is, and I, I was okay, and I had the old R9 that be prior to the 2019 edition. So I could get over that I had to get a new um, R9 module to have access to update the firmware to have the fix. But then when it came to, oh yeah, you need a completely new radio too. So your QX7, yeah, it's not gonna work either. You have to have an access radio. At that point, I was like, okay, so you're basically just telling anybody, your existing customers, FR Sky, if you want you know, the betterment in the R9 system that doesn't have this heartbeat issue, that doesn't have the jumping in frame rate, that you have to sell or get rid of all your old gear and get all new gear i'll just go crossfire so i went crossfire <laughs> a couple months ago i just bought a crossfire module so i have not been paying attention to the uh, r9 radio length i i think pal um does a lot with that kind of stuff and uh between him and bruce simpson i would follow those two in that regard i don't really have an opinion on the the uh antenna length what happens on, uh, it happens on sharp. Okay, so Brian's coming back and saying, uh, it happens on sharp roll moves. It just keeps sharp and snap rolls. It just keeps flopping back and forth after the movement. Having a hard time beta flight 2 point or 4.2. I have a similar quad, same motors and iNav, and that flies very nice. So it sounds like your, Brian, your P to D ratio is too high. So let's, let's drop the flight controller. That's well, it's not that big of a deal. So when you're getting oscillations like that, what you're going to want to do is if it's after a sharp move, you're going to want to reduce your P to B, P to D balance. So wait for this to hopefully show up. Come on. Come on. There we go. So in beta flight, uh, number of ways you can do it, but you have these sliders here, right? And the in sliders were the intent to try to simplify pit tuning a little bit because it's not, these numbers aren't just random. There's really two key factors um, in pin tuning. One is this balance between the P term and the D term. So the P term is you're pushing your spring that pushes the quad into sharp moves or pushes it back onto the onto following your sticks. And the D term is what dampens that push. So think of this as a spring. So I actually wrote these in the new configurator. So think of these as the, the spring, the higher the gain provides a tighter tracking, but can cause overshoots if too high in proportional to the derivative, the D term. Think of the P term as a spring on the car. So you have your, your car, you have the, the spring, you, you know, you've seen a strut before, it's a coil spring that 
holds the tire. If you would take the shock out and then push on your fender, it would just your fender would just bounce up and down, up and down, up and then it would slowly, you know, stop bouncing, but it would take a while. It would kind of slowly oscillate to a rest. The D term is the shock absorber. So the D term has the dampening force. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but think of the D term as the shock absorber inside. So those two things work together. Obviously, if the D term is too strong, then it's really hard to push the car down because the D term is fighting. It's fighting movement as you're trying to push the fender down. It's fighting movement as you're trying to push the, you know, as the as the springs trying to pull the fender back up. So you can't have too strong of a shock absorber, or you just have way too much dampening. Conversely, if the shock absorber is too weak, then you'll, and this is what happens when your shocks wear out, you'll push it down and instead of it going down and coming back up, it will go down, come back up, maybe like bounce once. So we'll have that, and that's the overshoot and bounce back. So if you ever went up and you had a old POS car and uh, you pushed on the fender, you'll see it will bounce down, bounce up, and then bounce back to rest. So and that's exactly what we have in quads. We'll have it bounce down, bounce back up, and then that, that bounce where it comes back down to rest, that's the bounce back we're talking about, That where it comes back to rest. So that ratio between the two needs to be finite, and that's what this balance slider does right here. You can see it holds uh, everything, all the numbers, and it just moves the D-term up. In, in previous versions, it worked differently. It held the D-term and it moved the P-term around. But in this version, uh, Betaflight 4.2, it they reversed that. So what you need to do is you need to increase your PD balance slider, it sounds like. One thing to make sure first is that your set point, your um, I-term relax, um, is set to, I would say if it's a seven inch, set it to uh, 10. What that does is it locks the eye term when you enter a sharp stick move because eye term can actually induce bounce back if your quads movement is delayed quite a bit from your stick inputs. Um, that will cause a big amount of pit error if your quads movement is quite a bit delayed and that will cause the eye term to wind up. So then when it comes back to set point, the, the eye term has to unwind and that will cause like a slow bounce back. So. Again, set this iTerm Relax to 10. iNav has iTerm Relax as well. I think the, I think its default is 10 for the cutoff. iTerm, uh, Pow Powell um, brought iTerm Relax from Betaflight into iNav recently. He's been adding a lot of great stuff into iNav. A lot of it's coming from Betaflight, but that's fine. Whatever, it's open source. I'm happy to see it in iNav because I, I use iNav too for long range stuff because of the all the GPS functionality. So um, I was really happy to see him add the dynamic notch. It's been needing that for a long time. iTerm Relax is another big one. Um, there's some other stuff he's adding in now. You know, not everything is, is as critical as everything else. iTerm Relax, iTerm, because that's a, this iTerm Relax is a PID fundamental called iTerm Clamping. So this is, again, if you just go on the internet and look for iTerm Clamping, it's like a basis of PID theory of like PID control, just like the P-term, I-term, D-term, feed forward. Same thing for feed forward. Feed forward is a basis of PID control as well. Um, so there's whole books on it. It's just implemented into Betaflight recently. And um, iNav is actually implementing feed forward as well in this um, 2.6 release coming up. I think they're going to do it a little differently. I'm not sure exactly yet. But uh, so yeah, get back, get back to this. Make sure it's set point 10, increase your PDD balance and just keep doing that until the bounce back goes away. You should not get bounce back on sharp moves. I have a video called um, Perfect PID Tuning Move. So if you go to UAV Tech Perfect Tuning, I think if you just go to UAV Tech Perfect Tuning. Yeah, Perfect Tuning Moves, these are the, the so check out this video, it talks about the different things and um, different moves that I do and that I recommend people doing to kind of test out a tune. I think it's actually this one, Flying to a Perfect Tune. This was the review where we talk, we kind of look at the black box and all the different details. And then also there's the UAV Tech 2-pack tune. Tuning, let's see if 2-pack tuning gets it. Yeah, right here. So this one's one where we use the perfect tuning moves 
and we use the sliders and a two to five inch and just two packs. It should be fairly quick. And it really boils down to getting your PDD balance correct. Uh, there's some settings we do first. We take the feed forward out of the mix, set the transition to one to kind of minimize feed forward. I wish this last notch would actually just turn feed forward off, but it, I haven't got somebody to implement that. I wish there'd be like one more notch here where you could slide it just at the very end, it would put all these to zero. But And then um, get your PDD balance squared by doing sharp stick inputs and full flips and rolls until you do not get bounce back. Just keep, make sure your eye term relax is set to 10. Just keep moving this slider up until you don't get bounce backs anymore. Uh, with a seven inch, I wouldn't worry about these D gains being up here. Um, so just keep moving this up. These D gains keep getting higher and higher, but a seven inch, you typically need some higher D gains. And then after that's set, well, many times for a seven inch, your P to D balance, the, the, the numbers here, so like the, the 42 divided by 45. So we can talk about that. The, as your power to weight ratio goes down, so like a whoop, and then the power to weight ratio seems to get higher. So it's the power of the quad versus the weight. So it's power divided by the weight. As you go to like a two inch, three inch, four inch, five inch, the power to weight ratio goes up. As that power to weight ratio goes up, generally your PDD balance goes down. So your P gains are higher than your D gains. Then as you go into like a six inch, seven inch, eight inch, nine inch, that power to weight ratio starts to go down. So it's almost like a curve like this. And as that power to weight ratio goes back down, you will need this power to weight or the P versus the D gains to be about the same. Generally on whoops, the, if you take the P term divided by the D term, you'll get about a one to one. So it's just, you know, this one, it's not exactly as 42 divided by 45, but like here, this is exact, almost exactly the same. 42 divided by 42 is one. That's what you would need generally for a seven inch, uh, about your P gains equaling your D gains. And then after you get that, where you don't have any more bounce back, and you want this to be as low as possible, so you have as much P gain as you can without having bounce back. So it's just right where you just don't get that bounce back. And then um, get that set. And then from there, the next step is just moving up your PD gain slider until you get D-term oscillations and then back down two or three notches. And that's it. should be tuned. Um, we can talk about filter tuning. There's some other things in filter tuning, but... Uh, that's that's the general advice there. So give that a shot and hopefully that works out for you. Let me catch up here a little bit. Uh, what's a good question as, as their length? 23 or something. Uh, what is a good question? And there is a length 31 or 32 sometimes. I don't know. That's a wavelength thing. Length, make a bit of So was tuning using your method of tuning using the sliders and burnt two motors in the process? Yeah, D gains around 30. Yeah, I mean, you have to be careful. I think in the, the, uh, the video, this one, I specifically talk about how when you're doing the tuning process, you need to, first of all, you're exercising the motors quite a bit in doing sharp flips and rolls. And if it's hot out, you need to be careful. And as you move up the PD balance sliders, this one, and you start to get the trilling oscillations, you need to immediately land. Um, when you get the trilling oscillation, the motors get hot real quick. And I think I said it exactly like that in the video. So I'm sorry that you burnt the motors, but guys, it does underline you know, when you're exercising your quad to tune it, you're ramping the motors to full throttle a lot. You know, when you do a full flip, a uh, sharp stick move to a full flip, full roll, you're sending the motors to 100% max um, to send it into the move and to arrest the move. So they're ramping from zero to 100 and zero to 100 again, opposite sides, obviously. So that, if you keep doing that and doing that and doing it, it's 95 degrees out, 100 degrees out. Fahrenheit, I don't know what that is in Celsius. Um, they'll get hot quick, so you need to, you know, you don't need to do 50, 60 times, just 
do it two, three times and move on. A lot of times I'll fly around a little bit in between. If you're kind of in the goggles and flying and doing the stuff, it's not as bad because you're moving as you're going, so it dissipates motor heat uh, more quickly. But if you're doing it line of sight, a lot of times I'm just kind of hovering in one spot and doing it. And you, gotta, you don't want to do it too much. And then as you guys obviously get to the oscillations, you want to be careful. So, yeah, um, sorry to hear that. So let me, uh, let me move down here. Anyway, you can help me with a noise dip issue, a nose dip issue, when I punch the throttle. I've got an increase and decrease in the eye term. Yeah, the eye term's not going to help you. So that's a, so Andre, um, that, when you have a nose dip, like what I call throbbles, that has to deal with, really you just need a, an, a good overall tune. Um, Having the P to D balance, this one, where your P gain is as high as it can be in, re in proportion to your D gain, where you just don't have bounce backs, bounce back is critical for not for good throttle control, where you're getting on and off the throttle, the throttles, or the throttle, and uh, also for prop wash, because P and D push together to combat any outside influence or any outside push, you know, wind or, or prop wash. And same thing for uh, throttle, you know, throttles. When you're punching the throttle, the bat, the quad kind of goes off balance. Well, that's almost like an outside influence because uh, it's the center of gravity kind of a thing. So having the P term as strong as it can be in proportional balance to the D term, so it's Basically, it's just below where you start to get bounce back or just above, however you look at it. So these values are as high as they can be in relation to these values in ratio to each other. So 42 divided by the, the 30. And then also having your PDD gain balance pushed up as high as it can be where you don't get trilling oscillation, that's, you, you have to have both. And, and... The other thing you can look at is moving your um, moving your battery around, like mechanical changes. Obviously, the throttles is a center of gravity balance issue. That when you're on full throttle, all four motors are ramped at 100% speed. When you get off the throttle, now all four motors are not pulling the quad up as high as it can, and it, obviously the quad's leaning forward too. So if you're moving forward in flight, that's that wind's pushing on the on the frame and, and things of that nature. So when you get off the throttle, the the motors lose authority, even though you have air mode enabled, and that causes you know a, ch a change. So working on your center of gravity with battery placement can help. Uh, a lot of times you don't have a lot of options there. Kind of it's all fit onto the top, especially if you have a GoPro. So the best next best thing is getting your PD balance squared. This PD gain is pushed up as much. Anti-gravity can help. Anti-gravity doesn't help with the quick like nose dips, but if you full throttle and then chop the throttle, and then you can see it kind of like wander around a little bit in the goggles, that's an anti-gravity thing. That's where you want to have the anti-gravity boosted up as high as you can. That will boost eye term to react to get that wobble to to stop occurring. But when it's like you're gunning the throttle like vroom 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 and it's dipping in the nose that's not anti-gravity is not going to help you with that it's too slow because anti-gravity is eye term based it's boosting these eye term gains and it's it's just too slow it's not going to help so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an indication where to go yeah and the presets of flying smooth uh brian's uh, his next question presets flying smooth uh, forward flight but the pitch and roll moves it just starts to get super floppy until it gets up out of control and disarm yeah you definitely need to I, I would watch those videos brian again get the pd balance this pd gain thing I, I the biggest thing i see with like seven inch and large quads is people are working with your your d term down even if you have even worse if d mins enabled and if your sliders are default like these d gains when d mins enabled of like 23, they're way, way too low for a seven inch. Like a seven inch will need, if you have demon enabled, you'll be more, generally, this is what you would see for a, so if you have demon enabled, 
generally your PD balance will be a 1.8, right? So it's 59 divided by 58, that's about a 1.0. So when DMIN's enabled, these are your active D gains. It's actually a little bit above that. So maybe it's a 1.8, maybe it's a 1.7, because the active D gain is in between the D min and the D max. Um, when DMIN's enabled, it kind of floats in between, the, in, in between there, depending on the moves. So that's what you kind of be looking at for a PD balance for a six, seven, eight, nine, ten inch. And then for the the PD gain strength, you'd generally be looking P and D gains, you know, around a 1.7 as well. So generally with a six, seven, eight inch quad, you'd be looking that these two sliders would be up around 1.7, 1.7 here. Now with D-min disabled. These would probably be lower, like something like like that ish, where it's a 1.4 and a 1.5. And this is um, hopefully that helps. This is a reoccurring pattern I see when helping people tune. I've tuned helping people. I've helped people tune six, seven, eight inch, nine inch quads, like 15 over the last three months, two months. Uh, some hands-on people have sent me some just black box and HD back and forth and they generally all are, all are about this area so maybe a good starting point is those two things just to round this up the I do get questions where people ask about the max multiplier I just use that to extend the range like if I need more range out of these or for some reason you want more I term um, that's what I use the master multiplier for I usually just leave I term at the defaults, it's pretty high already. Um, but um, you know, maybe I'm, maybe uh, you know, I could be doing better there. But I, I just usually leave the master here, and I, I usually have enough range um, between these two sliders here to get what we need. And then after you have that all tuned up, you, you can use your feed forward. Uh, I would say for a seven inch, you're probably going to max it out all the way and set your transition to zero here. So that feed forward activates right as you start to move the stick, and you'll probably need the max amount of feed forward, and in, in probably even plus some. But what happens if you get even more feed forward than this is your motor start to saturate. So it, you know your sticks will go to the right, feed forward will go directly to the pit sum and command 100% motor, and your quad will still lag the sticks. Well, if command if the motor commands 100%. Commanding 120% is not going to help. They can only do 100%. So it doesn't. That that's kind of a physical limitation at that point. So generally, when your feed forward's over to the side, most quads the, at, above that point, you're getting motor saturation. It doesn't really help. It doesn't necessarily hurt, but it doesn't help either. So, all right, moving on here. Let's see if I can get. Update, see where I'm at. Is my thrust linearization, yeah, so thrust linearization is another uh, tool you can use. Uh, some chat going on, presets and fly smooth. So Brandon is talking about thrust linearization, getting a decent tune, TPA, zero, thro uh, zero TPA, then set thrust linearization to 20. Increase thrust linearization to improve throttle on chops, raise PD gain. Yeah, and that's good advice. I didn't talk about thrust linearization. Um, so Brandon has some good advice here on tuning as well. Um, I don't know if we want to. I guess we can go down this rabbit hole. So when you go over to the rate profile tab, TPA's default starts to cut the D term by default just the D term at 35% throttle and above. And we've talked about this in the last live stream. It's more of a linear. So this is 0% throttle. This is 35% throttle. And then the D term will go down by 65% at 100% by throttle. So at 100% throttle, it'll be chopped by 65%. It will start chopping at 35% throttle and linearly you know, keep transitioning the D term down, down, down. To a, at 100% throttle, it's 65% of the D gains that are over here. That's with daemon enabled or or disabled doesn't really matter. A lot of times I move this up to 1750 just to get it out of the way. 
there's a lot of different tuning advice, but I don't, in my mind and in my world, you have to try to isolate things down. And if you have too many things active at one time when you're trying to tune, you don't really know what's causing what because there's too many variables going on. So I set this up so at 75% throttle, it starts to chop it down. And you're rarely above 75% throttle unless you're doing a full, you know, a full throttle punch. And when you're doing a full throttle punch, your motors are spinning so fast, they act like a gyroscope and kind of give you mechanical dampening. So you don't need as much D-term in that scenario. And the D-term adds a lot of noise. And when the motors are really humming at full throttle, that noise can feed back into the, the quad. So uh, it kind of kind of limit your full throttle performance. You won't hear it spin up as much. So this TPA is a nice way to get a nice 100% throttle, uh, full throttle punch. You can really, really hear it wind out. So I'll typically move this up. TPA is a, or a thrust linearization is a little different. I can actually have a graph here. I don't know. Yeah, I did this before on a, a video. But I have a video on thrust linearization. You check that out. And um, let me pull this up here real quick. So what thrust linearization does, I don't need that. I need this here is it acts as TPA, but it's not just on the D-term. So you can, you can change TPA, the classic TPA, to be on PND, but um, you'd have to do that in the CLI. At default, it just works on the, the D-term right now. But thrust linearization works a little bit differently that at 50% throttle, you have your normal PID gain. So let me just set these all to be the same, just to make it a little easier to, to see. So at 50% throttle, we can look in here. Right here is 50% throttle. So this is 0%, 100% throttle. And this is the adjustments it's doing to the PIDs. At 50% throttle, it is multiplying the PIDs by one. So you get the PID gains that you have. Above 50%, it's reducing the PID gains. Below 50% throttle, it's an increase in the PID gains. So by implementing, and if thrust linearization is set to, I don't even know it's zero. It's set to zero, which is the default. It's turned off, doesn't do anything. But as you set you know, that variable to five, you can see now the curve is less. If I can go to 10, curves a little bit more, 25. So this is the same settings you would have in the CLI. And to access that, you can go to just the CLI and type in get thrust. And you can see it right here. So it goes from zero to 100. And generally, the what I see people using the most is anywhere from, it's usually around 20, 25, because as you get these higher values, it's really jacking up the PIDs at the lower end and really reducing them at the high end. So around 20, 25. Uh, I would recommend tuning everything else first and then trying to implement thrust linearization because you're going to get to a spot where when you're looking at now this flight controller is going to reboot, you're going to get to a spot where you can't move up the PND gain slider anymore, right? So you'll get to a spot where you can't move this up anymore because these D gains will start to oscillate. And that's how you know you're at the max PID strength for the mechanical system you have for your quad. However, you can start to cheat it, right? If you implement a little bit of thrust linearization, then you'll be able to move this up one more. And you may not even need to. It will, if you're at the edge of oscillation here, just leave it there and then add some thrust linearization. You'll see that oscillation should dip off and depends where it's starting to oscillate. If it's obviously, if it's starting to oscillate below 50% throttle and you add thrust linearization, it's going to get worse. But if it's oscillating above 50% throttle, wherever you have this set and you start to hear that trilling oscillation, then as you add thrust linearization in, that will start to go away because these gains are going to be reduced above 50% throttle. So you can try to play, but it, you can try to play it with the balance between the two things. Um, and that's at your discretion. The reason I don't talk about it a lot is because that's, you know, it's going, I don't know if it's going down the rabbit hole. It's just, it's, it's more advanced tuning stuff and not everybody's interested in that. So, but uh, definitely take a look at Brandon's advice there. 
Let's balance the response to low, high RPMs. Too floppy at low RPM means too much thrust linearization, yeah. So you can get some um, different results with thrust linearization if you go too crazy with it. Usually what I hear is people want to I don't, I don't actually mess with it that much. What I hear is people usually saying between 10 and like 30 for thrust linear at the most. And it's usually just for larger quads. Uh, flies. Um, another question for Andre is, I'm already happy with how my quad handles prop wash and bounce back, but those nose dips is there. Is there an answer just to move fine tuning? Thanks for your advice. So that's, I think we've just been talking about that. Just try to keep the, get this P to G gain up as high as you can. If you want, just try to look at adding in some thrust linearization. Other than those two things, if those two things you just still can't get it solved, you're going to have to work on the mechanical, like trying to get that center of gravity pushed, you know, move the battery front and back a little bit, see what you can do there if you have any room. Uh, in 4.1.1 causes yaw turn to the left when full throttle straight up. So in beta flight 4.1, um, beta flight 4.0, beta flight 4.1, this yaw, I, I still think it's low, the defaults, I don't set the defaults. They went from a movement of, before we had feed forward, the default, uh, even the default P term for yaw was still pretty low. For a five inch quad and, and higher, your yaw P term, I like a nice high yaw P term. You can kind of do the same effect with feed forward for getting yaw to move rapidly. But the problem with feed forward for commanding rapid yaw movements is it doesn't help you for yaw wobble, where the yaw will twitch left and right. So if you're like, for example, in prop wash, sometimes you'll flip around 180 and you're trying to tune your prop wash stuff and you'll see it as you throttle up, you get like a little yaw jerk uh, as it's starting to ramp the motors up. That's increase your yaw P term. And you might have to go off the sliders. You know, you might have to just enter a value here because you're not gonna be able to get there with the sliders. So a lot, many times I'll have the yaw P term the same as the I term, so 90, 90. And that will help you with yaw jerking with full throttle punches or in prop wash scenarios because it will obviously detect yaw going off course and the P term will push it to be back on course and, and the yaw will still go off course but it'll go off since the p term is stronger on yaw with a 90 versus 45 you're doubling it you won't see it because the it's you know it's a stronger pushback to get back to fall the this the the sticks or the set point so and as long as you don't see it, it doesn't really matter all right a uh, quick explanation of iTerm Relax. Um, so a quick explanation of iTerm Relax. Yeah, I can, I can do that. Let me, um, let me see if I can pull up this log here. So this is a log I downloaded at the beginning of the live stream here. And uh, look at what time it is here. And so this should have some turning moves. So let's look right here. So this iTerm Relax is pretty straightforward. So here we have a little bit of oscillation we still have to work on in this tune, but it's not, it's better. So right here, let's isolate this down. Actually, no, I don't want to do that. So open up this log. Um, let's take out feed forward. Let's take out the P and the D term just to look at the sticks, so if you're not familiar with looking at logs, <laughs> which I'm sure a lot of people don't look at these as much as I do, but uh, what this is showing, and you can look at this diagram here on the, the right hand side a little bit, you can see the sticks, This the set point here, and you can see that these are the physical sticks, this is the readings coming from the transmitter, is 
basically he's got 36% throttle, 36.8% throttle to be precise. And he has, let me get this chat window thing out of the way. Let me go to, let me go to that. So, okay. So it's 36.8% throttle. Um, basically we're just keeping the sticks forward a little bit. He's got uh, slightly pulling it back here on the pitch. Uh, so it's not just cruising exactly forward. It's kind of bringing the nose up a little bit as he goes. And then as we get to this spot, it is a sharp, he's dropping throttle to zero and doing a sharp move to the right. You can see, watch the sticks here, it drops the throttle, sharp move to the right. And this is the, the command that the quad is trying to follow. This, this is the sticks, the set point. So that's what the thing's trying to do. The, the gyro here is what the quad is actually doing. So you can see the delay between the two. We can actually look, see this says 32 degrees per second. We can hit M for mark point. We can go out to where the gyro is actually hitting 32 degrees per second. You can see there's about a five millisecond delay. And when he moved the stick over to when the quad actually started to roll over, it's about a five millisecond, which is 0 0.005 seconds. It's pretty, pretty quick, but um, there's a delay between the two things, right? And as you increase feed forward, you can actually get this to match this precisely, which is honestly kind of incredible. As you move the sticks over, the quad is moving right on top of it with zero delay whatsoever. Here there's a little bit of delay, but like I said, it's 0 0.005 seconds. What iTerm Relax does is since there's this gap between the two, that is PID error. So let's look at trace template setup number three for this. Why aren't you doing it? Yeah, oh. What the? RC command. Oh, look at me. I re-messed up my trace templates because in black box, when I pressed control three to change the scene, it <laughs> actually saved that trace template setup. Okay, well, no problem. We will just uh, go back into my Google here, whoops, and bring this up. These are, uh, if you're not familiar and you're using black box at all, I have these trace templates you can Import so I can bring that in. So I can go to three. There we go. So this is looking at the same spot, it's just looking at it a different way. So when we look at in this view, we can then I can turn off some of this other stuff again. We are seeing the roll and then the gyro. This gap between the two that's your pit error. So if I look at trace template setup number three and I go to pit error view, so it's a pit error on the roll, you can see my pit error is building until it gets up to the spot where it matches. So let's just do this. Let's go roll axis here. Let's, yeah, there we go. So you can kind of look at both now overlapping each other. Let's uh, simplify it. Roll gyro feed four, we don't need that. Let's get rid of P and D. Yeah. And then let's move this graph above that graph. So this was the, oh, I took offset point. That was a bad idea. Oop. Add this back in. Set point roll, make it the same color. This was set to two before. Okay, yeah, there we go. So as you can see, this error between where the quads actually is and where the sticks are, this is the, the sticks, that causes this pit error to grow. This is what the P and D term are reacting to. As that pit error grows, the I term starts to accumulate and build up. You can see right here, the I term starting to accumulate. I term relax recognizes it's a sharp input based on whatever you have the cutoff set to here. So as the cutoff is lower, that means that the it will start to lock the I term sooner as you enter in a sharp uh, move. If the I term, if this cutoff is higher, like say 20 or 30, that means it's you know you'd have to do a pretty quick um, move before the I term will actually start to lock and not wind up. 
if you have your quad tuned where your gyro is matching your set point where when you know when you do a move you're using feed forward and the only way to get the gyro to track on, exactly on the sticks in any flight firmware is to use some sort of advanced you know some sort of pit advanced feature like uh, d-term kick or feed forward but if they're exactly tracking you don't need i-term relax i-term relax is only needed because of this gap that's generally there with a standard pit controller where you can have this pit error grow and since this pit error is growing the i-term will start to accumulate since if we wouldn't have i-term relax see where it flat lines here you can kind of look at the i-term here you can see these values, see it's going 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and then when it gets to uh, 1.8, it kind of just locks and holds. That's I-term relax in process. And then you can see right here, it starts to release, and it will. It's now I-term is active again through as it's sustaining the, the roll rate as it's rolling around. And then when we go to exit the move, the I-term locks again because it's recognized that it's a sharp move back down to, to zero and it will lock at the point now it's it happens to be 0.6 here and then as it kind of gets into a, a lighter part of the the uh, the move or where the sticks aren't moving as fast then the i term clamping will turn off and it will allow the i term to to operate as normal again if your gyro is tracking your sticks you don't need I-term clamping, you can just turn I-term relax off. If you are getting I-term induced bounce back, which is where you are doing a flip or a roll and you can actually see the bounce back and it's pretty slow, um, that, and I go into detail in, in some of those, a lot of my videos about it, that's generally I-term uh, bounce back. The best way to take that out of the picture is if you set your I-term relax up here. I don't know if I think I was pointing to this down here quite a bit. I shouldn't have did that. My bad. If you set your I term relax to 10, you're not going to get I term induced bounce back um, for almost any quad class from whoop. You may, if it's like a 9 or a 10 inch or a really low power weight 7 inch, but uh, like a 5 or a 10, the lower this cutoff, you'll just take that out of the mix. And what you can do to see if it is I-term induced bounce back or not, if you're not doing black box, is just set it really low. Just set it to 5, do a, a flip or a roll. If it still bounces, it's definitely not I-term. If And it, then that has to do with your PDD balance stuff that we just talked about up here. If um, you turn this, another thing you can do is if you're not flying beta flight, what I talked about before, like other flight firmers like KISS or... Um, flight one, you can just set your I terms to zero. And if you then the I term, then the bounce back goes away, it's I term induced bounce back. And then in these other firmwares, there's somewhat less limited, there's somewhat more limited options to address it, but um, that's how you can tell if it's I term induced bounce back or not. All right, let's go to the next question and see what we got. Thanks for all the time. Let's try that. Just a little curious, what are some other uh, applic what are some other applications for PID theory? So like other, what do you mean other applications? So Andre, um, like in the quad world or in the normal world? <laughs> so PIDs are used all over the place in the normal world for controlling valves and all kinds of stuff, uh, conveyors and your car, my car uses uh, uh, lane assist to keep me in the lanes. That's using a PID controller. My car also uses uh, eyesight so that when I'm, it's, it's awesome if your car, if you don't have a car with the eyesight thing, I have a Subaru where the, um, uh, where the um, cruise control actually detects the car in front of you and then matches its speed. That's also using a PID controller. So PID controllers are used all over the place. Uh, for some other fundamentals that could be implemented into the quad world, man, honestly, in the stuff that I work on, the stuff is so slow that even the 
a lot of the stuff that's in Betaflight we don't use. And we usually just use a PI controller. They don't even need a D-term in a lot of cases. I know my car, for example, and the lane assist does not have a D-term because it will bounce off the, it will actually start to bounce back and forth if you let go of the wheel totally be, between the white lines. So that's showing me it doesn't have a D-term because it's just using the P-term and the I-term and it's starting to just bounce and it will just keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and you have to grab the steering wheel. But uh, so a lot of uh, stuff out in other parts when it comes to to uh, PID control, they don't use all three terms. Uh, sometimes they just use a P, sometimes just an I, sometimes PI, things of that nature. For other things that could be added in the beta flight, I'm not really sure. I'd have to... Uh, to look into it a little bit more. Let me see what else I got. I'm just, uh, just. So the uh, Philip asks about uh, 24 kilohertz versus 48 kilohertz. So generally, it's a tough one. The PDWM frequency for a the motors, and I don't have a quad here to plug in, but we're talking a BL Heli. You will have a option for the PDWM update frequency from the ESC to the motors, and how quickly it's pulsing. The let me see if I can look something, look it up here on on the internet real quick. ESC PWM frequency. And what generally happens is if you move your, so we're talking about this variable here in ESC firmware, right here, this PDVM frequency. So this has nothing to do with the input from the flight controller to the ESCs. This is the how quickly it's pulsing the full throttle or partial throttle commands to the motors. Because electricity for the windings is either on or off. There's no other option, and how it goes from 0% throttle is it's off all the time. At 100% throttle, it's on all the time, but in between, for gradients of throttle, it pulses the electricity on and off And for, for the windings. How quickly it does that pulse is this PWM frequency. Generally, Lower PWM frequencies give the motor more torque, but if they're too low, it can be choppy because you actually will have, you know, when the motor, when it pulses on, the motor will start to spin up, and when it pulses off, the motor will start to spin down. Well, if the PWM frequency pulse is too slow, the motor will spin up and spin out and spin up and spin out really quick, and you'll actually see that, that, that shake, that vibration will come you know, back from the motor into the frame and into the flight controller. So lower PWM frequency gives you more braking torque because when you go to 0% throttle or a lower, you know, you're going from like 50% throttle to 20% throttle, it's going to give it more torque because that pulse that where it's at zero, that pulse length at zero is longer. So you're going to get more braking torque for prop wash performance. However, if it's too low, it can be choppy and cause vibrations. So at 48 kilohertz, your motors will generally be smoother, but you're losing some braking torque. And it seems to vary per quad on which is, works best. 24 kilohertz versus 48 kilohertz PWM definitely requires some tuning differentials. It mostly has to do with just the PD gain strength here again. So as you, if you are on 24 kilohertz, PWM frequency, and you want to be a little bit smoother flight, try 48 kilohertz. You may notice more wobbles and prop washes worse than just come in here and move up your PD gain slider. Conversely, if you're on 48 kilohertz and you want to try 24 kilohertz PWM frequency, you might set it down, go out, you know, go from 48 kilohertz down to 24 kilohertz in your ESC firmware uh, settings we just talked about right here. And the next flight you go out, it might oscillate like crazy. Well, that's because you've crossed over this thing where the D terms are too high, so you might have to bring this PD, P and D gain slider down a little bit between the two. So 
It's going to be quad specific or dependent. It depends if you have this tune to begin with. You might say, well, I've changed it both ways and then I don't have to adjust my tune at all. It's like, well, did you tune the PDG gain to be as up as high as it can be? Because if you didn't, maybe you're just at a spot where it's, you know, 24 works. Obviously, if you go to 48 and it still works, well, maybe you're, you could actually get better prop wash performance if you move the PDG gain slider up. But if you're, if it's like, well, I'm, I'm happy with it either way, it's like, okay, well then don't move it. You know, it's, it's your quad. So that's a, a little bit of a detail on between the 48 and 24 kilohertz. Um, for a, like a cine whoop, if you were looking for like smooth forward flight and um, things of that nature, when it's a, or longer battery life, for the smaller quad classes, you definitely want to try for, or have 48 kilohertz, like whoops, uh, toothpicks, things of that nature. For the larger quads, like four inch, five inch, six inch, seven inch, are four or five inch, three, four or five inch quads. I would, you might need to look at both. Depends what's really important to you. Um, depends on your quad too. Sometimes 24 works better than 48. For larger quad classes, generally 24 would be better because your motors have torque issues already. However, if you're really looking for smooth forward flight characteristics, then uh, 48 might be a shot. So it's something to play with for sure. Um, one thing that does seem universal with ESC and settings and whatnot is to change this motor timing, either be auto or bring this up to 23 to 25 uh, degrees for motor advance. So that's something you can pay some attention to, 23 to 25 degrees, kind of set it and forget it or put it to auto. And then this PWM frequency does have an effect on the tune. So if you're, you know, playing around with some stuff, definitely take a look at that. Hopefully that addresses that question. Ah, what else do we got? Hi from the Netherlands. We've got people from all over the place. Hopefully it's a good time. It should be supper time over there coming up. Or you're in supper time. I don't know. We eat at five o'clock, so it's probably already supper time for us. Um, on a Mac, there's another variable that can be in the kind of yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, the definitely, uh, there's a lot of depth in this hobby if you want to go down the rabbit hole. Um, trying to have beta flight, the sliders are, I think, were a big deal to have it that you can kind of choose your level of complexity. Hopefully the sliders help reinforce the concept of the balance between these two terms and that this PD gain strength is not. So these two things are not arbitrary. And these are not tuned for feel. You don't tune these for feel. You tune these for mechanical and prop wash performance. Um, arbitrary things are stick response. Tune that based on your feel. Maybe you like turn. You maybe like feed forward zero. And you know, it's it's fine. It's going to rely on I term relax. That's there to uh, not have I term induced bounce back because of the the what you will definitely have a wider gap uh, of, of lag, but a lot of times, I don't. I don't think it feels bad. It just uh, it's what you're used to. So yeah, these PD balance, PD gain are not arbitrary. They're definitely something that can be tuned for for the mechanical system. Uh, stick response. That's really up to you how how far you want to get on it. Any thoughts on D shot? Well, oh, Ciotti, look at that loaded question. Any shots on D shot twenty four hundred possibly being a part of the magic in Flydino Kiss's feel. What magic? <laughs> I don't know. I I don't I don't buy the I've flown all these firmwares. I don't see magic in any of them. Kiss follows a standard PID controller. Betaflight has one too. So does INAV and all these other ones. Has D term kick for a the feed forward thing. So KISS is basically Betaflight 3.0. Um, 
they didn't add all this other stuff. There's no I term reduce. There's no I term relax. None of that stuff. They do have. Uh, no, I don't think they have anti gravity. So it's simple, but they don't have any RC smoothing in Kiss. So the steps from your transmitter come in and stair steps. They don't smooth it out at all, and it causes motor oscillations big time when you have the D term set point weight in Kiss turned up to 100. You can see it in the logs. Um, here we can open it up here. Uh, so I don't, you know, people say, oh, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like, well, you can do the same thing in Betaflight. So just do that and it's cheaper. Um, they're filtering, I don't know for sure, but I think it's just a bunch of low pass filters. I think the fundamental of KISS was, was Look, we're just going to keep this this stuff simple. We're going to keep it basic to the standard PID controller, and then that's it, which is awesome. Um, but then to say, like, oh, it has more, there's something missing or something better than it's like, well, no, it's not better. It's just simpler. Simpler is not necessarily always better. The stuff in Betaflight was added for a reason. I demonstrated that when we did that 9-inch tune. Uh, I received some criticism that, oh, I should have turned up the PD gain strength on the kiss tune a little bit more and that would have solved the i term deuce bounce back but the motor i was already at double the i was already double the d term gains the motors were already warm and hot um i don't think it would have solved it because as you move the p and d up together it's not going to make you're moving your push and you're dampening up at the same time, which I can't make the P-term higher to get more push. So you're still going to have the same lag for the sticks. And if you have the same lag for the sticks, you're still going to get the I-term bounce back. It's just a limitation of the firmware. Um, so yeah, let's go into here. Uh, KISS logs. So let's look at this. So this is a, a KISS log. Uh, from a guy, uh, Crunk, he helps, he's on my Discord, helps a lot of people, knows a lot of stuff. He loves KISS. He uh, loves Betaflight too. Very knowledgeable guy. So all the respect to him. But um, you can see in here, this is this is the motor cans from KISS. You know, these jagged up and downs because they're not smoothing the RC input at all. You can see the set point here is just jagged. Um, and go to like you can see here look at all those if we would see that in beta flight we would say hey you need that's an issue you have oscillations in your motor commands you need to address that oh it's because you don't have RC smoothing but RC smoothing is not even an option I guess because it's simple um, if this quad has D set point weight set up at some variable if he wouldn't have the D set point weight up for the extra kick to reduce stick delay you wouldn't have these oscillations. Well, you'd have them. You'd still have them because of the P term sum. But um, but yeah, I'm not seeing any magic now. The getting back to the core of the question, you talked about the 2400 kilohertz update refresh rate for the PWM frequency. I don't know. It you know, Kiss runs at a one kilohertz sampling rate. So you have one, it's sampling, it's, it's analyzing the PID loop 1,000 times per second. They are updating the, I don't even know what 2400, it's not 2400, I don't think it is that. So D shot, no. I'd have to look. I don't know what the update frequency is for 24, D shot 24, because D shot 600 is 8 kilohertz. So 2400 is like way faster. So basically, the PID loop is running, and then it is telling the same thing at when you, for example, here, go to the configurator tab here. So Betaflight in this, so for like a KISS setup, basically it's running at one kilohertz update rate. All gyros are running at 8K. That doesn't, so that's why it's not even an option anymore in Betaflight. But then they're updating here, uh, we took it out of Betaflight. 
even above pro shot, it's 2400. So when you're at, say you're at one kilohertz sampling rate and you have a D shot at D shot 600, it's calculating what it needs to be the next motor command. And then it's telling the ESC eight times in between the next calculation, the same, the same thing. It just, yep, same, same thing, thing, thing. And um, at 2400, it's probably, I don't know, 50 times or something crazy. It's telling it the same thing. So I, I, I kind of um, made an analogy because I have two young kids of, this is like when my kids go, dad, 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 dad. That doesn't mean they're gonna get a better answer. <laughs> like just telling me, they're yelling my name 50 times. It's not gonna make it better. So the converse to that is, well, if it doesn't get the, it's a digital signal. So it's not like an analog, it's a digital signal. So maybe there's some jitter in it and it averages that out, but the higher refresh rate causes the jitter in the signal and it's a digital signal. So I don't know, I'm not, if somebody can articulate to me what the advantage of running your ESC refresh rate at 16 or 24 times that of what your PID loop rate is and how that's actually better and show me something like show me some data of how this is actually better, then I'll buy it. Other than that, I think it's, I don't it doesn't make sense to me. So 32, so, okay. So tw uh, D shot 2400, uh, would be 32 kilohertz. Yeah, I don't, why would you do a PID loop at one kilohertz, but then send your signal at 32 kilohertz? It's 32 times you're sending it before the next update, which the higher sampling rates always cause jitter. So it's like, well, it's that will reduce the amount of jitter that, that it's causing. So I, I don't know why you do it. It doesn't make sense to me. So I don't have an answer. Uh, for that. Um, some of the other things, I think KISS is simple and it works fine. I think the defaults are, I haven't flown it a lot on five inches, but I, I think that from, you know, respected people, I, I see flying the stuff, it, the defaults probably are really good for a five inch and people don't need to tweak it much, but uh, I don't know if it's as universal as Betaflight. Uh, zero RC smoothing. And you can save about 10 milliseconds of latency. Am I wrong? So yes, you are wrong. <laughs> the uh, the RC smoothing um, adds one frame of latency. You can, it depends what your frame rate is. So you're not wrong, Brandon. I shouldn't have said that. So RC smoothing, um, and I have some, I have a video on this. Uh, as the steps come in, let's see if I have an image, maybe I have an image handy. Let's see up here, propeller test, I don't know where I have that. So anyways, as RC smoothing comes in, it smooths out the stair steps in your RC rate. That's generally one frame rate. So if you have a crossfire that's at running at six milliseconds frame rate, it's usually delayed six milliseconds. So yeah, if you don't have RC smoothing, yeah, it saves about six milliseconds because that stair step comes in, but then you're adding this choppy commands to your motors, these oscillatey choppy commands. So either way, I, and I'm not justifying one way or another, but I guess I'm looking at, well, if you wanna not do RC smoothing, then just set this to interpolate and set it to off, and there you go. Now you have beta flight with uh, no RC smoothing. You don't need to use other firmwares. It's, I mean, you can, but you have the flexibility here too to do whatever you wanna do. So you can turn off RC smoothing in beta flight, clean flight, emu flight, any of the open source variants, even in iNav, just by setting to interpolate, setting to off, and then you don't have RC smoothing anymore. Yeah, so my friends always talk about how KISS is better than Betaflight. I'm, I don't, if somebody can articulate specifically for what. I think some, some things, um, there's, 
when you buy into something, you want it to be better, right? Like when I buy a TV that I think is fancy, I think it's the best TV ever because I bought it. So I don't know. I'm just not seeing it. He hates to, uh, Ciotti says he hates to admit it, but he feels something different in Kiss. Definitely not in Flight 1. and makes me more confident when I'm flying around. So then set, Ciotti, then set, I guess I would say for, if you want to implement Kiss with Beta Flight, turn off RC smoothing, turn off the dynamic notch, set your filters to, I would guess I would turn off uh, these I would turn off the dynamic ones I would probably set them back to old school 100 cutoff static low pass on gyro 90 low pass on D term probably have this as bi quad because that's how it used to be in beta flight then I would go to your PIDs tab I would turn off feed forward uh, I would turn off iTerm Relax. I would turn off Anti-Gravity. And I would tune this or, you know, you, you know, I don't know how the defaults will work. They should work fairly good for a five inch. Um, again, turn the dynamic notch off so you'd want to come into here. Oh, change this down to one kilohertz, which will help with noise. Change this to I guess the highest we can go is D shot 600. Again, turn off the dynamic notch here. <laughs> if you really want to kiss, turn off the OSD. You don't have that option. Um, but uh, I guess they have air mode or idle up. You might have to in implement idle up. I'm not sure if they have air mode. I can't remember. I'd have to look back. But uh, either do an idle up or air mode option there. Yeah, do that, and I bet you that will fly pretty close to the same as KISS. And you can do it with the flight controller you have. Uh, when it comes to, I guess, the the Flight 1, it's, um, that's running 32K sampling, supposedly. Um, there's issues with that. Um, I, don't, I don't They might not even be running 32K sampling anymore. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Uh, it's kind of behind closed doors. Um, it's more of a load, load it, fly it. If you like it, awesome. If you want to understand how specific things are working, it's it's not as easy. Uh, any other questions here? We're wrapping up. We have uh, just a couple more minutes for you, Hillis, if you have it. Yeah, definitely. So uh, Tim uh, or Tom uh, suggested if you have mid throttle oscillation issues that definitely go up to 48 kilohertz definitely for sure that um, nine inch quad i tuned had apd escs uh, which are pretty interesting they actually have i'd love to get some i don't know that they make them i don't know that they make apd escs for like a normal five inch quad they're more like x class but it has auto uh PWM, and I don't know what that specifically does. So here's the, this is the configurator for the APD ESCs. That, that's what this had. I, I was unable to, in their most current, so if I do APD ESCs, RDQ, in their most current uh, firmware releases of APD ESCs, and they're mostly for X class. They're expensive ESCs, but uh, they are implementing, I think you have now the option to do pass-through through the flight controller, I believe, and the option to do RPM filtering. So I'm, that person that got the 9-inch quad back, they're actually getting the ESCs updated, and they're going to implement RPM filtering, and they had some NTO issues, and get this switched up to 48. So I'm going to be working with them back and forth. Uh, remotely on that kind of stuff, but these are the APD ESCs. What they have in here that's kind of interesting that I noticed is here, if we zoom in a little bit, so they have the normal, ah, why can't I slide over? 
There's no slide bar at the bottom here. So you have the normal uh, motor timing advance, you know, five to thirty. So you can set that manually. The PDBM frequency from twelve to sixty kilohertz. But then they have this auto timing. So BL Heli has the same thing for auto timing. You can. That's an option. They also have this auto PDBM drive frequency. I don't know what that does, but I think that's be interesting to toy around with it a little bit. So if anybody knows, that, that could be interesting. And then. Uh, you know, they got the ramp up, response, ramp down. So they have the start, same thing, motor start power up here. So a lot of the same settings as BL Hell ES, just a little bit more robust ESCs for kind of bigger quads. It'd be interesting. I'm more interested in just the firmware settings and options, uh, but I don't know that they make ESCs that are, I guess you could put these ESCs on a five inch, but it'd be kind of overkill in it. At $45 in ESC, that's something I probably won't be doing anytime soon. Let's see what else we got. So Kiss is a naked, yeah, so Brandon, yeah, as far as I can tell, Kiss is a naked PID controller um, with just a sprinkle of filtering. I wonder if it can't handle bad props or, yeah. Oh, there's Crunk. <laughs> Uh, Crunk, that that's actually was his logs, and he's on the, the chat as well. He, I think he's doing some flight comparisons. So, Crunk, I'd be interested to see, like, what I was saying here. You know, if you would set beta flight up, something similar to the one kilohertz and all this kind of stuff, kind of just simplify it, right? Just take what's there. You know, obviously, take turn the RC smoothing off, take the, you know, the, the filter settings and make those kind of simplified because I, I my guess is the low medium medium high that kind of stuff just slides these uh cutoffs up in kiss you know i don't know what the adaptive filter does um but my hunch is that it's low pass as far as i'm aware beta flight you know and, and the forks of beta flight are the only ones that uses notch filters like i don't believe kiss does i don't i think Flight One is starting to look at using notch filters, uh, from what I can can understand, but uh, they're not yet. But it'd be interesting to see the difference between those two. Specifically, logged would be the really the interesting part. And that's you know the HD is one part, but the logs really that's what reveals uh, what's what. So it's not just uh, subjective; it's more objective, and that's that's what I'd love to see. Um. But no doubt, uh, I would say the defaults for KISS, I guess, um, I don't have direct experience with it, but through uh, when Crunk is experienced and he's a hell of a pilot and a hell of a tuner and all kind of stuff, he says it, you know, you can just load it on a five inch and it works pretty well right out of the gate. And I think their defaults are really honed in for a five inch. Um, beta flights are centered around a five inch as well. There's a lot more stuff thrown at beta flight though, too. You've got you know, a user base of 200,000 people plus where the KISS user base is maybe five to 10,000. That's something that people don't recognize a lot with this flight firmwares is that like flight one, KISS, maybe maybe five to 10,000 each use it. And you can tell somewhat, like go look at how many people are connected to their Facebook group and how many people are connected to their YouTube channel. And I can tell, you know how I tell? When I upload a video about anything other than beta flight, it doesn't get hardly any views. When you upload stuff about Betaflight, tons of views and, and, and whatnot. Um, and Betaflight, we know how many people use it through the configurator, you know, through the, through the downloads, whatnot. That's all online. So you can tell how many people are using it as it uses statistics. So the user base of Betaflight is 20 times, 30 times that or more, 100 times that of you know, other firmware. So the the stuff that's thrown at it, that it has to deal with and cope with is a lot better. And I think the devs do a hell of a good job at that. But uh, let me go. Any other questions here on tuning? Can you tune out the yaw washout on whoops? Or is it a power limitation? 
probably a duct limitation. What I would say to tune out yaw washout on whoops, if it's a yaw twist, is get these. First of all, the the PD balance or the PD gains need to be really high. So like for a whoop, generally I'll, you'll see, I'll see, and you'll see the same thing in Mockingbird. The, I came to these, um, you know, the Project Mockingbird for whoops settings is out there, and you'll see these same things. But they usually have it's a one to one PD balance, and I've talked. Um, I'm forgetting the guy's name now. Uh, Patrick, I think it's Patrick, um, about it in, in length, but same thing, one-to-one -one generally, but then you'll have these, those general settings. So you have P and D, 80, 80, 80, 80. Go to Project Mockingbird, check out their settings, and then for the best thing you can do for y'all is just get that P gain up as high, and don't be afraid to go up higher. I mean, it's there's no negative ramifications. I mean, the max you'll be able to go is, yeah, 200. So anything above that, but don't be afraid to experiment and try higher P gains, but that will help. That will help y'all take priority of the control signal going to the motors. Yeah, that's the way I want to say it. Because you got to realize that this all comes down to a PID sum for roll pitching y'all. And that PID sum, so it, it really just sums the gains or the sums the the error times the gains and it goes to a pit sum for roll between the P, I, and D. So you're just, when you're tuning these gains, you're just saying what's more important than the other thing. <coughs> but ultimately, when the gains, so the pit sum would go this way across here, right? So it's gonna take the error times the P gain, the accumulated error times the I gain, the differential error times the D gain, it sums all that together, that goes out for the yaw command or the roll command, same thing for pitch, same thing for y'all. Then when you have the gain magnitude different between roll, pitch, and y'all, you can tell it, like if you have your y'all gains two times that of your pitch and roll, that means in the mixer, y'all is gonna be two times as important or more priority than pitch and roll. So you can have it kind of, it's gonna be at the sacrifice of the other two, but you can kind of get it more in balance, I guess is what I'm saying so that you don't get the y'all wash out, but then maybe you'll get a little bit more wobble on roll or pitch. So you can kind of use that to balance what do you specifically want. Do you want to, and, and it's probably somewhere in between where it's like you get a little bit more wobble on the roll and pitch, but you can't see it as much, but then the washout's not there as much. So think of your PID gains as just you implementing what priority you want in your flight performance for the quad by moving those up and down and things of that nature. Uh, first part I would start is definitely bring that yaw P gain up, way up. Uh, what is, or something about the, what is your direct approach to moving from 3.5.7 across the board quads to 4.2? Uh, the pit controller from 3.5.7 to 4.2 one, 4.0, 4.2 is all the same. So there is no difference in the PID controller. So I would literally take your, if you have filter settings that work well in 3.5.7 and PID settings that work well, I would just bring them across. Um, just do some screenshots and type the numbers in. That's the simplest way to not confuse things with doing paste and that kind of stuff. Same thing for filter setup. So 3.5.7 does not have dynamic low passes, but you can turn those off. So you're not going to be using the sliders because 3.5.7 doesn't have them. But it has these low pass one, low pass two. I think it's, I think it's 100 and 300 is the default. And I think I can't remember what the defaults are, but they're both PT ones. I think this was 100 and 200. And then it has the dynamic notch. Uh, the Q for 3.5.7 would actually be 3.5.7. Yeah, the Q would actually be like 70. It's, it's pretty low. You could probably, I would recommend just keeping in 4.2 the default of 120 for the Q. Um, in 3.5.7, you don't have the dual notch option, so just set this to zero for width. And the min and max is pretty narrow so 3.5.7 should be 125 and 350 would be the max that it would go in 3.5.7 so those were 
honestly, that those are the limitations of 3.5.7. This, um, but if it's flying really well for you, I mean that that's what's working for you. Um, the normally the Q for 3.5.7 was lower, which means the notch would have more delay and latency. But since the targeting in 4.2 or 4.0, 4.1, 4.2 is so much better, you could probably get away with a narrower notch and just keep these, that will keep that notch within these bands of 125, 125 hertz to 350 hertz. So that's what I would do for the filter setup. And then bring your PIDs across and that's essentially it. Um, I think the rest of the defaults for 3.5.7 are the same like uh, yeah, your RC smoothing. Um, the default was filter and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then the configuration stuff, I think, is basically all the same. So that's what I would do. Just bring the bring the settings across from the, whatever you're using or the defaults from 3.5.7 across into 4.2. You're going to get the same flight experience because it's the same PID controller. There's no difference. Uh, what's good fellas okay so all right well we are at 1201 so be, be at the end see if there's any more last minute quick ones um if not appreciate you guys uh coming to join me this morning hopefully you found some useful information in my ramblings and uh peeled off some good advice to help you with your tunes KISS ESC, KISS ESC runs at 125 kHz PWM. What do you think about that? I think that probably makes it a lot smoother PWM update frequency. That's interesting. That's really fast. Is that on the newest ones, Crunk? Uh, the old ones surely can't be that. That had to be for the, F, the F3 the F variants. It's interesting, F3 ESCs, by the way, fellas, they don't even go down Below, I think 24 kilohertz is the lowest they go, even for so. And if you're getting any of the um, F3 processor ESCs, they won't have a lower uh, update rate than 24 kilohertz. I've noticed. So do check that out. Okay, guys. Well, that is it. Going to wrap it up. Appreciate y'all coming out. Enjoy your afternoons or evenings. Get there, fly, and we'll see you here at the next one, whenever that will be. Thanks, everybody.